Good morning, all. I would like to welcome you all here today to our seminar. To all the special needs assistants, parents representatives, school representatives, union representatives, advocacy groups, and other stakeholders, welcome. I want to welcome the president of FORSA, Michael Smith, who's with us today. Michael works in the school sector also as a school's completion officer and has always been a great supporter of SNAs in every way possible. I would also like to welcome Cormac Devlin TD, Paul McAuliffe TD, Jim O'Callaghan TD, John Lehart TD, Senator Mary Fitzpatrick, Senator Jerry Harkin, and to any others that may be on here, you are most welcome and we truly appreciate your support in our campaign. My name is Noreen O'Mahony. I am a lot of things a wife, a mother, a chairperson, and I am a special needs assistant. It was my first love. And as a special needs assistant, I am a professional. We as SNAs are professionals. I know from personal experience and from speaking to thousands of SNAs over the past seven years of being a union activist, how we have the expertise and knowledge to care for the wonderful children that we work with. It is now time that we are recognized by all as professionals and the first step in this is raising the minimum education qualifications for our profession. I'm now going to hand call on Andy Pike, National Secretary of the Education Division of FORSA, to address you. Thank you very much, Noreen. Uh, good morning to everyone, and thank you for taking the time to attend our seminar this morning in such large and, and ever-growing numbers. Um, I'd also like to thank our SNA speakers who have recorded contributions for us today which will ensure that the voices of SNAs are heard loud and clear at each stage of our programme. We have a couple of changes to our programme, um, which uh, includes Ms Caroline Quinn speaking on behalf of the IPPN. Uh, we have uh, speakers from UCD, but we must express our sincere condolences to Professor Billy Kinsella, who's unable to join us this morning due to a recent family bereavement. Uh, but we're very grateful to Phyllis Clegg and Liam Fogarty from the UCD School of Education uh, for stepping in to assist in, in Billy's absence. We must also thank Dr. Jean Hennifer from Hibernia College for assisting us this morning, as Dr. Mary Kelly is unable to join us. These are some of the uh, pitfalls of organizing things in the middle of a pandemic, um, also on a Saturday, uh, which complicates things further. The aim of the seminar is to facilitate discussion on the future direction of education and training for the 17,000 special needs assistants working across our school system. The event this morning forms part of a wider campaign titled Respect for SNAs, which aims to raise awareness of the role of the SNA and to take steps to ensure that that role is properly respected, valued and recognised. When you try and summarise the role of an SNA, it becomes very clear very quickly that the job is complex. The demands vary considerably and the skill set has to cover a wide range of competences. Every day across our schools, SNAs are assisting students with additional educational needs. You'll find them supporting students with ongoing difficulties, assessing the curriculum, accessing the curriculum rather, assisting students with profound communication needs, supporting students with a range of behavioural problems, assisting students with a range of complex medical needs, especially in our special schools, and assisting students through the administration of medication and much, much more besides. So the work of our SNAs varies and all of them have to be able to support students in ways that could not have been anticipated when the minimum essential qualifications were set all those years ago in 1979. Since the statutory scheme was established, the role of the SNA has evolved. It's changed, it's become more demanding, if you need evidence of this, look at the increasing number of posts allocated to our schools, more and more posts each year, yet it's never enough to meet the demand for support. This is because our SNAs have succeeded in assisting countless thousands of students to gain an educational experience that just would not have been possible without their support, skill and dedication. And this has created greater awareness of the potential for students with additional needs, not just to participate, in programmes of education in our schools, but to play a full part in the school community. This happens if and when they're assisted and facilitated to realise their full potential, very often with the help of their SNA. Now, the role of the SNA is not to teach or deliver a curriculum, and very often a discussion on the extended role of the SNA can end very, very quickly with a conclusion that teachers are there to teach and the SNA is there to take care of toileting and hygiene needs. And it will always be the role of the SNA to meet those needs, but the role doesn't stop when they leave the bathroom. They have an ongoing role to play in assisting students 
in accessing and staying focused on the curriculum, often providing assistance side by side, offering encouragement, advice and guidance as part of that student's learning experience. In special schools, the range of complex needs that our SNAs meet would in a healthcare setting very often fall to a qualified healthcare professional. Those SNAs dealing with very challenging behaviour could correctly compare their job to that of a qualified social care worker. My point is simply that the role of the SNA is complex, it's varied, and it's difficult. That's why it's so frustrating at times to see our SNAs considered as unskilled or unqualified staff with little to offer students beyond meeting hygiene needs and toileting. The outdated perception of our SNAs is based on the lack of an appropriate professional qualification. Across the public service, in health, social care, education, and other fields, every large staff, staff group has a realistic entry requirement that ensures that whenever an employee takes up post, they have the required level of education and skills to carry out their job to an acceptable standard. SNAs appear to be unique in that for them, no such standard exists. We know that so many SNAs are well qualified, but we also know that those qualifications were obtained in the absence of any formal framework for assessing the competences needed to work as an SNA beyond the desirable criteria set by local interview boards. Colleagues, we believe the current requirement for three passes in the junior certificate is outdated and it desperately needs to be reviewed to reflect the current educational achievements of SNAs and also to ensure that every new SNA has a qualification that equips them to meet the needs of students in our schools. If you talk to parents about their expectation of an SNA, they will tell you that they hope their SNA is kind, empathetic, and willing to support their child in a very new and sometimes difficult school environment. And we would all share that aspiration. But parents will also tell you that they expect the SNA to be properly trained and qualified to support their child. They expect the SNA to know and anticipate the specific needs that have to be met for students with a range of different conditions. They do not expect the Department of Education, as is the case, to stand over a 40-year-old qualification bar, which is completely out of date and out of touch with the role of the SNA in our school system. Forza believes it's time to recognise the value of the role of our SNAs by taking the step of establishing a new entry-level qualification, initially at level six, leading to the option of a level seven qualification. Such a move would do away with the notion that SNAs are unskilled workers and would put the role on a proper professional footing from which students and the whole school community can only benefit. So we hope that the seminar this morning will stimulate discussion on the future for education and training for SNAs. And look, there are different views on what that future should look like. One issue we cannot ignore are the conclusions of the NCSE review of the statutory SNA scheme uh, on which the government policy on the school's inclusion model is based. That's why the frame of reference for our discussion today is how the education and training for SNAs can help prepare for an inclusive future with SNAs supporting students to maximise their independence within an inclusive school community. We're very grateful to all of our speakers for taking the time to assist us today. As we go through the contributions, please send in your questions Questions, and we will ensure that as many as possible are discussed with each speaker in turn. Thank you. Over to you, Noreen. Thanks, Andy. We will now have our first SNA video. So this is Pamela Larkin from the South Dublin, South Leinster SNA branch. Hi, everyone. My name is Pamela Larkin. I've been an SNA in a mainstream primary school in Dublin for the past 16 years. In that time, the role of the SNA has expanded greatly. We, in recent years, we have needed to know more about medical models as well as intellectual and emotional models. That has um, led to SNAs having to basically gain their own education in these different areas. Um, as far as my job goes, um, it can incorporate OT, psychological needs. It can also incorporate speech and language needs and they all interconnect. So what happens there is I have to source my own courses. Uh, the principal is very supportive, always sends any courses she hears of to, uh, to us, to the SNAs in the school. But um, basically, there's no assistance from the government. We have to look for our own courses. A lot of the times they can be on during school days. So we're kind of left between a, a rock and a hard place and that we have to either choose to do the courses to benefit the children or we miss days and have to take on paid leave which is unfair 
teachers very rightly get substitutes in when they go on courses so because it benefits the children and i feel that this would really benefit snas to help error sign children as well and um, the days of the three d's and the junior cert have long passed we as i said we incorporate so much nowadays between medical emotional and psychological needs and I really feel that we need to push now for respect for SNAs and increase our opportunities and assistance from the government in not only providing the courses, but providing us with the financial assistance and supports that SNA needs, that an SNA needs to help our children in school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to our first contributor uh, who's joining us today from uh, the, the world of education, and that's Miss Caroline Quinn, who's a principal teacher at Our Lady of Good Counsels Girls School in Johnston, uh, Kalini. Uh, previously, Caroline lectured at the Marino Institute of Education in initial teacher education. She's also spent four years with the primary curriculum support program at national level, delivering training to schools uh, as, a, as an advisor for literacy. Caroline's a member of the uh, Irish Primary Principals Network, Dublin Committee, and also serves on the National Council representing Dublin. She's currently uh, a member of the, uh, uh, she's currently chairperson of the National Association of Boards of Management in Special Education, but today Caroline is representing the IPPN, the Irish Primary Principals Network. Over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Andy, and good morning, everybody. I can hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, I'm delighted to be joining FORSA today for this fantastic seminar on SNA education and training. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be representing the Irish Primary Principals Network, as I, you know, I'm really pleased at the connections that are being forged with IPPN and with FORSA, and long may that last. Um, today, I suppose I'm here to share a narrative, a narrative of our school, a narrative of our fantastic team. Uh, the theme I've chosen today is team. Together, everyone achieves more because we all know that that's certainly true. And boys, oh boys, are we blessed with the team that we have in Johnstown. Um, I am also very pleased that this important conversation about the future of this role is happening. Um, and I think it's one that we need to, to stay with and see through to its conclusion. Um, I hope all the technology works today. Thank you, Andy and Alan in the background. Um, it's very difficult when most of our work is usually relational and here we are today speaking to an audience we cannot see. In the house here, I have a student on, on line with Hibernia and a son about to do an exam. So as you can imagine, um, the bandwidth here today is, is working hard. Um, in preparation for today, I consulted the people who matter most in this narrative, and that's the SNA team in our school. Um, Andy has already said it, it is becoming harder and harder to define the role um, with the many skills and demands and competencies that this role has. However, I think it's important that we do try to define the role in order to move forward. And before I begin today, I suppose I would like to um, pay a huge tribute to our colleague Jackie McGovern from our SNA team, who passed away at the very beginning of the first COVID um, as she was involved in a hit and run. And Jackie epitomised all of the that was good about the SNA team in our school and all that is good about the role. And I know that, you know, in her memory, the SNA team in our school, um, they just take that job so seriously. And now to move on. So I suppose everything that happens in our school is based around the ethos that underpins what we do. And whether you're an SNA in the school, whether you're a pupil, whether you're a teacher or in school management, we really do seek to promote an ethos that's welcoming, that's tolerant, open, listening, safe, caring, aesthetically pleasing and fun. And the reason that I mentioned that list is that the SNA team in our school are involved in promoting every single one of those elements of our um, ethos. And so therefore we like to think that we are an inclusive school. I would however say that every time we say that to ourselves, we ourselves then say, well, are we? 
Uh, so we constantly reflect, we constantly hold the mirror up to ourselves. There will always be somebody from the team coming to say, you know what I was just thinking, maybe we should. And that's the kind of school that we have. Um, we're firm in our belief that it takes the whole community to raise a child. So all of us in the school, our parents, the wider community, all of us together uh, want to make sure that, you know, children have the very best and most positive experience of learning in our school. So what is the context of the school? There are 27 teaching staff members and look at the number of the SNA team. They, are, they number 21, which is an allocation of 15.49. Um, pretty big by any standards in a mainstream primary school. But I show that slide because of the importance that this team hold within the, the, the staff of the school. We have three special classes for children with autism housed in the meadow, a very, very happy place in our school for the last 10 years. We have five mainstream SEN teachers, three ancillary staff, and pre-COVID, and hopefully when COVID has long left us, we also have five part-time teachers. And that makes up the team, that makes up the jigsaw that is our school. And if any one of us on any given day are not present, then part of that jigsaw is missing. Together, we make up the picture that delivers the provision that is provided in our school. <coughs> so. We have 17 mainstream classes. We have 416 pupils, mainly girls. We share a campus with the boys' school of equal size. So just over 800 pupils come to school every day on our campus. As mentioned already, we have three special classes and those classes are actually mixed. So just to say, um, Andy was talking about the definition, <coughs> excuse me, of the role earlier on. And it is important to note the complexity of need with the, the children that come into our school each day. So the pupils with additional needs, some have physical disabilities, plenty have the sensory impairment. There can be mental health issues, children with English as an additional language. There can be social issues. And we have like every other school in the country, diverse pupil profile. And that diverse pupil profile that comes into our school, you know, is allowed to access the curriculum and access their education and all elements of it because of all the members of our team. And you can see the additional needs that the SNA team in, in our school are dealing with. <coughs> so the school team really does work as a team with shared visions and goals. And as I said earlier on, all of that is based on the ethos that I already outlined. Teamwork is central. It doesn't matter what area of the school you're working in. And, you know, not just the area of the school you're working in, but also in the overall ethos of the school. It's all about teamwork. Um, we're particularly strong on confidentiality, on respect for each other. Um, I cannot imagine working in um, an education environment where there isn't respect for all of the members of the education community. And so it doesn't even arise in our school. Is there respect for the SNAs? It is explicitly there. Uh, there is and should be support for everybody who works on the team, um, because this is, as Andy has already outlined earlier on, one very complex job. And of course, there's always the element of trust. We open the doors in the morning and everybody goes to their part of the buildings and the trust is there that a fantastic job is being done every day. And actually, it's very interesting because of COVID, we have staggered entrances and exits and you know all that, that kind of thing well yourself. But we're seeing the children enter the school in much smaller numbers. The parents don't come into the yard, but to see the SNAs walk to the gate in the yard to meet the children and to see the children bound and bounce in that gate to see their SNA in the morning is something that would melt a heart of stone. It really is a joy to behold. Um, we're a school committed to restorative practice, and that's a way of thinking and working that's adopted by all in the school to make it the best possible place to learn, to work and to play. So it doesn't matter if you're the principal of the school. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher in a classroom or in a special class, if you're one of the SNAs or if you're one of the pupils in the school. We're all committed to this restorative practice. And I'll talk a little bit later on um, about, you know, the elements of training that everybody in the school, including our SNA team have done on restorative practice. 
this is showing you uh, the outside of the building of the meadow. And this is where a group of nine SNAs work. And it's a particularly happy place. I just want to show you some of the inside of the building. Why am I showing you this this morning? Because in talking about this role and the complexity of it and the definition of the role, I want to show you some of the lovely environment that is created for the children in our school between teachers and SNAs working as a team with the SNA team central to all of the beautiful decoration that's in the school. And you can see home corner work. You can see into one of the classrooms here in the meadow. And it really is a very special place. You can see here again uh, the gym and I know Pamela was mentioning earlier on the complexity of the role and all the various things that an SNA might be involved in in a day through working with skills uh, based on speech and language, working with the skills based on occupational therapy and indeed a myriad of other skills. This is a picture of the sensory gym in the meadow and at, you know a place where the SNA spend a lot of time um, allowing the children to you know to blow off steam, to self-regulate uh, maybe do some of their OT exercises and it just gives you a little flavour of the kind of thing that's happening. This is just the inside of the senior class again in the meadow and you can see little individual stations there where the children work at and I just want to give you a close-up of that. So you can see underneath the, the care and love and TLC that was given to a child who sometimes just wanted to lie under the desk not to do any work at the desk. And I can guarantee you that that was an SNA that arrived in and that just happened. Um, so that magic wand happens at all times over the school. This is the top of the desk. And you can see there, I don't know whether you can see, but you can see all the little icons there on the side that are used for the choice boards. There's a social story based on maybe what's happening during the day. There's the in and out tray of work. And the amount of work that is put into working with the teacher uh, that the SNA puts in and making sure that everything is there for the child that the child needs in a day. The child, the children don't even see it. It just all appears. And that is something that um, we are so grateful for in our school. So I was in a classroom when the FOSS scheme of classroom assistance uh, started. I'm, I'm writing there the 1990s, but I think it could have been the 1980s. And I remember back to that time pre the term SNA was actually used. Um, and I think even back then of the dedication and the commitment of the people that worked with me in my classroom, um, they were those that set out the path and laid the foundation for what we know in this role today. And I think it's pertinent that we're here today talking about the next chapter and the next development of that role. Um, I think Andy has already said it, but I want to reiterate it from a principal's point of view that, you know, the education profile of the SNAs that work in our schools does not bear testament to the minimum requirements that we are seeing um, for, for the role itself. The training and the continuous professional development that is done in all schools out there, and all of you are nodding your heads probably this morning saying, yeah, that's me, I do that too. But certainly I'm going to share a little bit of what our team do in our school. One of the things that we talked about in the school when we were consulting about this is the idea that we really want to also add add into the narrative of this conversation that we want young people to see this as a career choice. We want young people in secondary school to be talking about, you know what, I want to be an SNA. And this was really brought to fore uh, because the newest member of our team is in her 20s. She has a level eight degree, but she really didn't like what she trained in. Um, she always wanted to be an SNA and she had the conversation with us. Why wouldn't young people see this as a career earlier on coming out of school? And I think it would be wonderful to actually add that into the narrative of this conversation. So what's the education profile of the SNA team, the big SNA team in our school? Well, we're taking for granted level five and level six is there. We have people with level seven from St. Angela's. We have level eight. We have qualified Montessori teachers qualified nurse on staff, people qualified in banking and finance. So you can see that there's a diverse education profile already in our school, but all over the country in those that are doing this job at the moment. Um, and it really is an insult to all of them to see this minimum requirement that is being set, uh, set out there. 
So in terms of the future, what is it we're thinking about? What is the conversation that we had in our school? Well, in terms of education itself, recognition for qualifications actually entering the system. Um, as already mentioned, seeing this job and this role as a career choice for school leavers who in the main in this country are coming with the leaving certificate at the very least. Um, we want to see a very definite programme, and I know some of the other speakers will allude to this this morning, of training in service. We want to see recognition, <coughs> excuse me, for the training and the CPD that is being done by those in service. We want to see what accredited courses would look like. And I know this is a, a conversation happening wider than the circle we're at today. But why wouldn't there be courses with five credits, 30 credits, 60 credit courses that people can add according as they build up their training? We want to see a modular design where there can be a choice in the kind of training that you do. And this is the sort of conversation that's happening amongst the SNA community out there. Um, so what are the kind of elements of training that the SNA team in our school are doing? This isn't just new to our school. This is happening in schools all over the country. So the SNAs are doing general training and the promotion of positive behaviour, understanding and creating a supportive education environment. I mean, such wonderful, wonderful stuff. And the basics of first aid, manual handling, child safeguarding, those kind of things. Um, but under well-being, looking after the person yourself, as well as the well-being of the rest of us in the school. 17 of us, teachers, management, SNAs alike, took an eight-week dot be mindfulness course, um, which was absolutely wonderful and wonderful to do together um, to share the narrative of the different places we work in the school. Teaching Happiness, the hidden curriculum, that wonderful brain cam program that is being used by the SNA teams in our school. Restorative practice, feeding into the culture that is in our school. And of course, SNA wellbeing and resilience. Um, the, then, of course, there have been an awful lot of ASD specific CPD courses and just a selection of them there. Now, this list reads really well. Um, people have undertaken a personal insight into autism, the Understanding Autism course. Um, I think that one's with ISEP, creating a low arousal environment, autism learning styles and the impact of visual methods, anxiety management, sensory processing, the kind of things that the SNAs are dealing with on a daily basis. Attention, autism health, autism and mental health, movement and sensory breaks, autism sensory workshop, anxiety management again, and sensory processing. I already mentioned those two. And, you know, taking part in this kind of CPD and doing these courses makes the job an awful lot easier as you come to understand the child and understand how to help them regulate so that they can actually learn. Other courses the SNAs have done in our school, dyslexia, working on transitions, which of course can be very difficult for children. Speech and language strategies, occupational therapy strategies, and some of these courses are internally delivered and some are externally delivered. Those uh, courses, a lot of the courses that were done on autism there were done through the Middletown Centre for Autism. And it's a huge tribute to the SNAs in our school. And it's important to be recognised that a lot of those courses were done on a Saturday. Um, and pre-COVID times, the staff travelled to Middletown. I know they made a day of it and had a nice lunch and that nonetheless, this was time given outside of school uh, to upskill for the betterment of the children within the school. They have looked at cognitive behaviour therapy, managing anxiety, sadness and anger in children, literacy and numeracy, and indeed work on uh, Down syndrome. I suppose what, what I want to say today is I'm putting out the question there, what will the future hold? And I think, you know, there are plenty of us around who want to be involved in this conversation and IPPN are certainly one of those organisations. And I suppose what I'm saying is let's all of us create the narrative together for the future. Um, let's look at what the next steps are, stay on this road and help FORSA and indeed the SNA team to, to, to actually forge forward on this. Thank you for listening to me this morning um, and I wish you well with the rest of the seminar and indeed with the rest of this campaign. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Caroline. We've had a few questions come in from uh, 
participants, and you mentioned um, one aspect of the work of SNAs that we, we don't often hear much about. That's um, the role they might have in supporting students who might have mental health difficulties, for want of a better description. Uh, could you just explain a little more about how SNAs would be playing a role in supporting students who might have um, uh, mental health issues? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I suppose we all know so from I think time... you're muted, Caroline, which Am is... Am I muted the problems there? Problems all have. Um, okay, I'm unmuted, so uh, Alan, maybe no, you can... we still can can't hear you, Caroline. Alan needs to unmute me. I hear you fine. Okay, you can hear me now. Good. Okay. Um, thank you, Andy. Great question. Um, all of us know in our schools, and certainly more so in the last two years than previously, that we are seeing more and more issues with mental health in our schools. So whether it's the children in sixth class dealing with, you know, anxiety and perhaps trauma, maybe, or whether it's the children with autism who seem to get to a certain stage and realise their, their difference is magnified if you like. Um, what we normally would do in the school is obviously, um, you know, a, a diagnosis or anything like that is beyond our remit. But once we have got to a stage to where we actually know what we're dealing with, we take our lead from the outside agencies and the profession. So that could be NEPS or it could be the school age team. And they would, you know, it, it, it would be really um, on the TLC end of things, movement breaks, talking to the child, walking through the garden in the school, maybe doing a little bit of gardening outside where the child gets a sense that they can talk. And what we found in the school is that the children talk hugely to the SNA because that, you know, there's a huge build of trust there. They feel safe. There's a safe environment. So there could be any, doing anything from baking to gardening, um, not taking on mental health issues in the professional sense, but, you know, providing that safe environment within the school where the child feels they can talk. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, we have another question. I think it relates really to what education centres are able to do by way of uh, the provision of uh, training for SNAs. And the question really relates to are the education centres funded in the same way that they're funded to provide training for teachers? Are they funded to provide um, training and courses for SNAs? Um, now, that's probably slightly beyond my remit, but my understanding is that they get a budget for training. And I know in our local education centre, in Black Rock Education Centre, they certainly run some courses for, for SNAs. But I think that it behoves us, as we move this conversation on, to take a serious look at that and to engage the directors of the education centres, who will be only more than delighted uh, to provide um, training in the local area. And remember that our education centres are all over the country. So that's certainly something that can be put on the list today. Uh, just two other questions that have uh, come in. During your time working in the education system, you, you, you've mentioned that you recall previous incarnations of the, the, the SNA, uh, the child care assistant role. Have you seen a change in the type of applicant, the type of candidate that applies for a, a job as an SNA over the years? Is it still the same as it was back in the day or, or are there differences now in the type of person who applies and their aspirations? Well, I think basically, first of all, I would say that anybody applying for that job has that very keen emotional intelligence of kindness and care and empathy and all of those things that we would want in an SNA. Um, there's a very diverse education profile of people applying for, for SNA jobs now for all sorts of reasons. And I think the system can only benefit from that. And I think that's why this conversation is so important today. Thank you. The final question, which is one from, from me, actually. Um, do you think that there is um, support for reviewing and changing the, the minimum educational qualification amongst school principals generally? And we're not going to take any answer you give as being the IPPN position, but just from your, your role in the education sector, uh, how do you think uh, uh, the suggestion of reviewing that qualification uh, would be received by the, the school principal community generally? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving my personal opinion on that, Andy, but I would say without a doubt, 
the education community and certainly the principals of Ireland would hugely welcome um, the, this, you know, the re-examination of the definition of this role. And not alone that, but I think through our representative body in the IPPN, we would like to be involved in that. Caroline, thank you very much for your contribution today. It's been very illuminating um, and very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from um, Linda O'Sullivan. Linda's an SNA from the North Dublin and North Linster SNA branch. It's great to have a forum like this where we can explain both why SNAs individually and the education system will benefit from an increased educational qualification as the minimum standard for entry into the profession to become a special needs assistant. This increase is central to the FORSA campaign for respect and recognition for special needs assistance, as we believe this lack is at the core of many of the issues we deal with on a daily basis. Issues such as the 72 hours, supervision, allocations, job security and work at the discretion of the principal. Many of these problems we believe would not exist in the same way if there truly was respect and recognition for the value of the work that we do. The job of special needs assistant and its contract emerged in 1979. Just imagine Jack Lynch was Taoiseach, postal workers across the country striked for 18 long weeks and I was yet to be born. Unsurprisingly, much has changed since then. As the complexity of the roles we deal with on a daily basis have changed and grown, so has the role changed significantly. SNAs are needed more than ever as the state fulfills its obligation to provide a meaningful education to every child with additional needs across the country. What hasn't changed, however, is that to become a special needs assistant, you still only need three Ds in the junior certificate, a minimum educational requirement which has no bearing on either the reality of what employers are looking for as desirable qualifications or the efforts that SNAs put into ensuring we have the skills needed to support the children we work with. It belies the complexity of the role that we do and the efforts we put into our jobs. Indeed, COVID-19 has highlighted the true importance of SNAs for pupils, families and schools. We have proved time and time again that we are a group of highly skilled, highly educated and highly committed people who want to provide the best care needs possible to the children we work with. Recognising the reality of the level of edu educational achievement and skills needed to do this is far greater than three D grades in the junior certificate. Along with the need to be able to develop as professionals in our careers, we'll support SNAs to truly provide these supports to the children. In education, we hear the mantra, of inclusion and the whole school community, yet many SNAs being treated as somewhat less than inner schools is the reality. For SNAs, recognising our professionalism is an important step in being treated with the appropriate respect and recognition for the vital work that we do. As an SNA, I know the value of my role and the difference that I make to the lives of the students and their families. I am entirely aware of the lack of respect towards SNAs and their role and feel it stems between the educational requirements to become an SNA and the reality. The official belief that the current level of education is, suffi is sufficient is both insulting and misrepresentative of the educational standard of most SNAs across the country. I'm aware that we have many listening and watching today from across the worlds of education and politics. All I ask of you is the following, that you recognize the reality of these outdated qualifications and publicly support your campaign to raise the qualification to a realistic level and publicly support us as you can. I'm certain that if you ask around your family circle of friends or work colleagues, you will find someone who has benefited from having the support of a special needs assistant. I'm asking that you put your trust in FORSA and in SNAs and work with us to change the minimum education requirement. I will leave you now with a quote from Jack Jerkin of the Irish Primary Principles Network when speaking for respect for SNAs. SNAs are the unsung heroes in our schools. 
They are frequently the difference between children with additional needs making it through school or not. It is time to treat them as an invaluable faculty and indispensable colleagues. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Linda. By coincidence, perhaps Linda is one of the students studying on the UCD uh, education program that's uh, been funded by the Department of Education, uh, along with probably many others on the call, actually. Um, and that training program is very, very significant in that it's the first time uh, in a long time that the Department of Education has organized formal um, uh, training and uh, educational programs for SNAs uh, across our schools. So we're very grateful uh, today to have an input from the UCD School of Education. Uh, just to repeat our condolences to Professor Billy Kinsella and, and to thank um, firstly Phyllis Clegg, who's course coordinator uh, at UCD uh, for joining us today. Phyllis is a former primary, post-primary and special school teacher. Um, she's also uh, worked as a lecturer in special education at UCD. Um, Phyllis is currently responsible for the development of content and the pedagogical design of the SNA uh, program. And Phyllis, you're, you're very welcome. Phyllis is joined by Liam Fogarty, who's uh, an educational technologist uh, in the School of Education at um, UCD. Liam's primary role at the moment is to support is supporting the design and delivery of the National SNA training program. Liam tries to employ the pedagogical principles garnered as a teacher uh, and developed in the online learning space to provide the best learning experience possible for students. And Liam's approach to online learning resulted in the UCD Teaching and Learning Award for Outstanding Contribution <coughs> to Student Success in 2020. Um, Phyllis and uh, Liam, you're both very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Andy. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, I think, uh, you, you know, you've covered a lot of what I was going to say in my introduction. But thank you for your very kind words um, on, on behalf of Billy's absence. And indeed, we do send our sympathy. Um, so thank you for that. And I just want to commend you and Caroline and indeed the two wonderful SNAs who've contributed for providing us with such a deep and detailed insight into the role of the SNA. I think uh, you have allowed us into your world, particularly Caroline has let us into our school and we, we saw there a, a very fine example of what should be a vibrant and inclusive school where the SNAs are playing a, a more than significant role in, in everything that's happening. So uh, I want to commend you all on that. So we're here um, just to, to give you an insight and I'm here as the coordinator as Andy said of the national training program for SNAs and we're very proud to be delivering this um, you know with the School of Education in UCD and we're doing this on behalf of the NCSE and the Department of Education. So uh, it's a privilege indeed for me to get this opportunity to recognize this significant role and that role as I said has been very very significantly described there by, by um, both, both the previous speakers. Special needs assistance, you know, being a very important sector within our inclusive education system. They're, I suppose, a relatively new addition to the mainstream education system, even though, as, as Linda said there in her previous address, they're around since the 1970s, but that would have been mostly in the special school setting. Uh, and indeed, not much has changed in terms, and she's quite right about that, in terms of the original description of the role back then. Irish um, legislation of the time in the 90s, in particular the Education Act and the Epson Act, you know, facilitated and opened the way for movement uh, towards inclusive education within our mainstream school system. And this has opened the way for the need for, you know, significant number of additional adult support people. Um, so all of this is still a work in progress. And to say we have arrived at a situation of inclusion in this country is not accurate, but notable progress has been made and parents now have the right to choose where, what they perceive to be the most suitable setting for their children's education. SNAs, there's no doubt, have greatly facilitated this to happen. And I have worked with wonderful SNAs in my career. I've had nothing but positive experiences. It's, it, and this is what's driving me to be so passionate about this particular topic. International experiences of adult support systems reflect many different approaches. In Ireland, however, we've consistently focused on a system where additional adult support for primary care needs and needs arising from medical and neurological conditions are provided by our SNA scheme very often with 
very inadequate training provided. To be an effective SNA requires a wide range of skills, as Andy said earlier on, across a very wide range of disciplines, uh, in order to focus on care, communication and consolidation of teacher-led learning, which results in pupil independence and access to education alongside their peers. By delivering this high quality national program, training program for SNAs um, in UCD, we hope that we are showing our recognition and our respect for the importance of the role of the special needs assistants. We acknowledge that they have waited a very, very long time for this recognition, and we're very proud to be the ones to deliver this. We acknowledge that there has also been a very significant investment in the SNA scheme over the past number of decades, culminating in, um, you know, in um, and all of this is culminating in what we now see as this national training, among other things. With over 17,000 SNAs in the system, and indeed plans to increase this number, according to the last budget, by a further 1,000, uh, I think it's, it's very well acknowledged that the contribution of SNAs to the system is very significant and highly important. Special needs assistants provide a wide dimension of support for care needs, which fall outside the remit of teachers. However, the combination of teacher and SNA is an extremely powerful one and has proven to be most successful over the past number of decades. Prior to the development and delivery of this course, we in UCD um, School of Education carried out a consultative process. Indeed, we were talking to the IPPN and various other stakeholders. We talked to SNAs, we talked to uh, parents, we talked to teachers and schools, etc. And in order to to get a profile of what exactly was needed in terms of the development of the particular course that we are now uh, very advanced with in UCD. And we completed as well, we completed a survey of existing professional development of SNAs as they registered for the course. And we actually got a 100% response rate to this survey, which was just incredible. And this research activity has actually given us, given us very valuable data regarding the profile of our current SNA population. We've actually done it a second time and we've, we're finding that there is a consistency um, across the two cohorts, but we haven't actually um, written the report on the second one yet. So in the following two slides, you are going to see details of prior training and education. And just in a general way there, you see that only 12% of the SNAs registering for our course had no specific training, although they had done training in other areas. And 88% of our SNAs registered in our course had training specific to the role. Um, in the second slide, now that you're going to see in a moment, um, it's really important. This is a very, very, very powerful um, indication of what Caroline was speaking about earlier on. And you will see here that almost 80% of students on this course currently have a QQI level of five and above with a very notable 41% already having completed level six. Now, these figures are very, very important and very useful for the discussion that we're involved in here today. Um, and, you know, in, indeed going forward for, for making decisions around an amended minimum qualification for SNAs, which we hope will be imminent. With the role of the SNA embracing a wide range of disciplines, as Andy described in the beginning, it became necessary to draw on existing expertise within the UCD campus. And we had we were very lucky to have a significant collaboration between the School of Education and the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Health Systems. And this very unique um, you know, collaboration has resulted in getting specialized knowledge and information from a range, a very wide range of clinicians and specialists on how to support needs arising from medical and complex conditions, be they medical or neurological. And this particular module has proven to be a, a, a first really, and was greatly, uh, you know, applauded and very, very appreciatively uh, accepted by the students. The content and design of the course that, that we're currently delivering has resulted from very extensive development and consultation with a wide range of experts, both from wider education and from health systems. My own experience of having worked with SNAs within a teaching career, which spanned primary, post-primary and special school settings in a period of over 20 years, gave me a very deep understanding of the role and an appreciation of the value of that very special relationship between the teacher and the SNA in order to provide a most supportive environment possible for the most vulnerable of our young people. Now, 
in this in this next slide here, you will see a brief profile of the program as it is structured. And um, the program is structured, as you see here, and I'm not going to read these for you. You can just have a brief glimpse of these. We have five modules um, representing the structure of the program. So you can see that uh, we cover a very wide angle here. It's really important to, to just highlight very briefly module five uh, to answer a question that came in on the area of mental health. In this particular module, we have focused very, very especially on SNA well-being and giving them the skills of resilience to deal with those mental health issues that were mentioned in a prior question um, to, to this panel. So the philosophical basis for this entire program is inclusion. And we have interrogated all aspects of inclusion through carefully chosen content. Inclusion, you know, is a very difficult thing to define, has been variously defined, and is sometimes very misunderstood. We have encouraged students to engage in critical reflection throughout this program in order to become comfortable with their own definitions and, you know, also to inf be informed by their own professional practice. Inclusive education just cannot happen without the presence of SNAs in classroom. However, in order to ensure maximum effectiveness of the overall support structures already in schools, the classroom dynamic really does determine the success or failure of that support. So in order to get that right, communication and relationships are central to success. And we have explored these topics particularly vigorously. We have also stressed the ultimate goal of this support as achieving independence for those students who receive support. For many, this will actually happen and they will achieve independence, mm -hmm. but not for everyone. And we must be realistic about this. In the following slide, we just very briefly here refer to how the SNA sits and is pivotal part of the overall system of support within Irish classrooms. So just have a quick look at that. And then we're going to move on to a, a, a succession of three slides. And I'm going to just, again, I'm not going to read from these slides, but I want to show you how we have linked our five modules and how we have embedded inclusion and inclusive education within all of these, um, these particular uh, modules. So I presume these slides may be available after this particular seminar. So you will get a, a more of an opportunity perhaps to have a, a closer look and read these. Um, and, you know, just it's important to recognize here that this course that we're delivering in UCD is part of the overall school inclusion model. And it arose from that, in, you know, extensive review that was done of the SNA scheme uh, back in 2018. So we can move on there, Liam, if you like, to, to um, number three and four. Um, and you can see there that we th these are particularly important, these two slides. I'll just very briefly make reference to these. Um, you know, in terms of um, the specialty of these particular, we had a very, very big team involved in devising a, a module on autism here, which was uh, was was never it, it had never most of the material in this was very new. It was based on research that was conducted within the last two or three years. So a lot of the previous um, theories and information around autism was completely overturned and now has been replaced with all the new thinking and research um, research based information that we, we managed to to put into this and I think the students were were in awe of this particular module from what we, we read uh, then the one that I mentioned earlier where we collaborated with the School of Nursing and and midwifery and health systems resulted in a module which again had not been done previously for SNAs where we went into a very, very explicit range of supports for students experiencing care needs as a result of medical and neurological conditions. And I think this was a particular success. So um, that's the final one that I mentioned. I think we, we've already mentioned that, Liam, we can move on from there. So inclusion, um, you know, uh, the role of, of Liam's role in, in this is going to is going to be coming up in a moment. And we work very closely together, as you probably gather. The final, as I said, the final module that we did there was was very, very significant. And we believe that, you know, it it really um, I think in current times, particularly, it has come home to us that everybody is experiencing anxiety. And we also have become aware that there is an increasing evidence of mental health issues among children. So we, we have devoted an entire module to this whole area. And you can see some of the topics there that are coming up based on an overall well-being, um, you know, a, a theme, which, of course, has been you know, put in place in all schools, uh, you know, by the Department of Education. And there are guidelines there for that. 
So in conclusion, I just want to say that we believe that we are delivering a very, very high quality program here, which has been much acclaimed by the current students. We have we have the hope as well that this program will be extended for use across a much wider sector within the educational community in order to ultimately achieve a consistent and high quality preparedness for all those who teach and support students with additional needs. The same messages need to be heard by all adults in our schools in order to achieve a cohesive and effective inclusive education system. So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts now. And I know we're restrained a little bit by time. There's lots more we could talk about. But I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Liam Fogarty, who is my uh, partner in this. And he's going to present details of the technical development and delivery of the course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phyllis. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak about the technical development, the student engagement and some of the experiences we've found so far on what has been a very uh, positive experience, um, hope for us and hopefully for the students as well. So small bit of context uh, just to, to give you some information on my role. I'm responsible for the design delivery of the online and technical elements. I work very closely with Phyllis and the programme team and all of the contributors we've had um, and our colleagues in the School of Nursing and all of our external uh, speakers and contributors that we've had in the development of the course. And most importantly, supporting students throughout the course um, from the induction all the way through to the conclusion of the course and hopefully make them comfortable with the technology and um, being a presence, and Phyllis and I try to incorporate that throughout the course, being a presence for the students, which is especially important when we have um, a thousand students at, at its maximum and we have two cohorts at the moment, so we have 1400 students. Um, a little bit of, of further context on, on the course. It's unique in um, it's unique in its its design. Um, we have, as I said, we have a thousand students. With a thousand students, um, it can be difficult to create a supporting environment and to foster community. But we have aimed to resolve that through our design. I'll speak a little bit further about that in a moment. Um, also, when you have a thousand people doing anything, you are going to have people coming with different backgrounds, um, different experiences with technology. So we had some anxieties about that as well. Um, but hopefully we alleviate them throughout the course. And some of the ways we um, resolve those challenges are by we use Brightspace, which is our virtual learning environment in UCD. An important part of this course is that students are using UCD students and they have access to all of the systems that um, all of our UCD students have, um, including Brightspace, IT services, IT support, multiple means of support we've incorporated throughout the course. That is that we have Phyllis and myself and then we have tutors. Uh, for every 50 students has a, or approximately a tutor. And then we have um, peer support, class reps and discussion forums, which I'll speak about um, again in a minute. Responsiveness to students' needs is a large part of our course. That is through learning analytics and some of that data I will go through in terms of engagement. And I will speak a lot about engagement because I think it's an important part of the this morning's discussion because it demonstrates the dedication that SNAs have to have to their role, which has been made this course a pleasure to work on. Um, the course designed with UDL principles applied to promote accessibility and to empower students to be self-guided um, learners. So uh, when I talk about that, that's universal design for learning. Uh, building community and having that level of support that I am um, just spoke about. And when I speak about universal design for learning, that means multiple means of representation, action and expression and engagement. All of these things hopefully coming together to build empowered learners and to um, to assist SNAs uh, in their role. Um, so in representation, we have different formats to the um, to the way we present all the information. Um, we have different media types for the course itself. We have a week of the content that they access asynchronously. So they work through quizzes, small presentations, and then we have a live webinar, just like the one we're in this morning. Action and expression will be that students have their discussion form, which I'll speak about some of the stats from that, again, demonstrating students' commitment to the role and commitment to uh, professional development, which has been extraordinary and has broke um, every metric in UCD um, throughout the course, which is a university with 30,000 students. But the engagement on this course has actually skewed heavily a lot of the engagement metrics in the university. So we tried to make the course novel, memorable, and again, um, 
one team of, of what I'm going to speak about is the intrinsic um, engagement and extrinsic extrinsic engagement. So we can design the course with all of these principles employed, but the desire the students have and the, the commitment to the roles is the engagement is what really brings the engagement. And again, that has been truly uh, phenomenal. Um, so a quick look at the course itself. Uh, this is the course in Brightspace. You can see on the left hand side there, session four, five and six. So we have six sessions in each module. Um, uh, we have a, a and then on the right hand side, you can see how the content is presented. So we have a video from Phyllis each week, which, of course, is to build a presence um, that we have to, to, to try and build with so many students on the course. Then there's a kind of learning journey from the outcomes through to a checklist. The aim of this is to um, make to scaffold the learning, of course, of pedagogical princi principles of life, but also um, to, to motivate, not that there are students needed much motivation, but to have a, a goal that they're they're working towards. The learning blocks are kind of the, the 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 meat of the sandwich, I guess. That's the where the learning is done in terms of the presentations and everything else. And then we have the community, which is built through the discussion form. I'll give some of the stats on that, as I said, in a moment. But you can see it's all embedded in the course. So there's a purpose for the discussion form and a purpose for, for everything on the course. There's a place for everything. We start from the video, we come down to the checklist, and then everything is also provided with a takeaway, which is basically a script of the, of the session and a podcast, which is all of the the um the audio from the session put together after students would work through this week they would then have a webinar on the on the following tuesday so they would work through for example one of our most powerful experiences on the course so far and i remember and some of our students that are here and um, will remember i think clearly as well we had a, a session on cardiac delivered by our, our colleagues in cooperation with our colleagues in the School of uh, Midwifery and uh, our nursing and midwifery. And then after they worked through the content on the Tuesday, we had a webinar uh, delivered to us live from uh, the cardiac unit. I think it was in uh, Temple Street. Um, and it was yeah, a very powerful kind of way to, to bring the session um, on and, uh, and a kind of example of what we do in the course. A quick look at what the learning blocks themselves look like. So they're developed on our external software. Again, scaffolded, you can see this learning block uh, delivered um, with from Dimpton Devani, who is a, a children's nurse in Temple Street Hospital. So working with Phyllis, myself, and our colleague Suja to design that. Um, this is a, a quick screenshot from the, the ASD module. Um, there are kind of all interactions that the students would click to give an autistic person's perspective. Um, here you can see some live videos that we uh, um, put together and then put in the learning blocks. Um, there are colleagues from the um, School of Nursing. And there were some quizzes that the students worked through, some scenarios in our module four primary and complex care needs. And then here again, you have learning checklists. So we have different types of assessment, different modes of, of the students being able to, to tick off what they've learned. Again, it has been a pleasure because the students come with so much uh, motivation. Um, so moving on to the discussion boards, which is an important part of a community, which we have, again, we have our presence, a prompt and a purpose. You could see the purpose was that it sits within the session. So a lot of times discussion boards become a little bit of a, a, a white elephant, I think, where nobody accesses them and nothing happens. Um, but I think this has been extraordinary and I would imagine is one of the best examples of discussion board activity, um, definitely nationally, perhaps further beyond. You can see here each week, so session one, session two, if you see those numbers there, you see 1,000 students posting in a week, the following week, 986. Across both, I just checked this morning, across both cohorts and there's all of the, um, so we have 1,400 students since January, we have a total now of 35,000 posts. So that was about, you know, a thousand posts each week, sharing their classroom experience, speaking about the learning of that week, truly remarkable dedication, uh, like I said, professional development, and again, a pleasure to work on, but really, most importantly, demonstrates the, the commitment to learning. Um, so support wise, we have ongoing tech support, um, tutor support, responsiveness, like I said. Um, a quick look at some of the engagement analytics. So I've taken two examples from module four, our last module in a, with our second last module for our first cohort. 
96% of students access content, 93% access and all content, 4,000 discussion posts for that, really high average score. Again, the symbiotic relationship between what we put together and what the students give us um, makes it just a, an amazing experience to be a part of for any educator. Um, and then module one, which is our new cohort of students. So we have 939 students there. 8,000 posts, so just to demonstrate that it wasn't a one-off with our with our great first cohort, which includes some of our, our students and indeed speakers this morning, but it, it, it's remaining consistent, again, showing the commitment to the role. Very quick look at the, the content, interest and engaging. We had probably 80% responses to this, but 100% in one, 99% in the second one. And then we have um, the content pitch level. So just right again, 90% and 95%, um, which is interesting when, as you Phyllis outlined, the um, background, educational background that our students come with. And then just a, a very quick kind of sub aim that we had um, throughout the course is developing and empowering students for a digital world. So we had a quick survey on the the confidence of online learning you can see the blue bar and then at the end um, or the orange bar sorry demonstrates how it has this is only after one module um, so again a pleasure to be a part of and i will conclude with some testimonials i guess i gather from the discussion form uh yesterday uh wasn't a, a request for testimonials it was one of the last discussion sessions that we that we had um, for our, our cohort too. And I just gathered these from one or two um, different groups. Um, the, the, as I'm sure our students that are, are here this morning and, and Phyllis will attest to, these are, are fairly common posts and experiences. And I would like to say again, that it is a, an absolute pleasure to be involved with something like this and to work with such dedicated professionals who, um, who are really just remarkable people and wonderful to work with. And I think the teams, if you were to take out some of those words there, would be respect. So I think hopefully in the course we've designed, we've shown the SNAs the respect they deserve. Um, and they have certainly given us back in terms of engagement and commitment um, more than we could have, have ever hoped for. So thank you very much. Apologies if we went a little bit over time, but thank you very much. Thank you to... Um... Phyllis and Liam for your contribution. I should have mentioned at the outset that there is a hashtag we're using for today's event and that's hashtag respect for SNAs and if you check what's trending on Twitter you see uh, the top is Nefet unsurprisingly uh, then we have the Late Late Show trending and then we have Christmas very important but then we have respect for SNAs moving up the list. So please start tweeting with the hashtag respect for SNAs and let's see if we can uh, get that hashtag about education and training for SNAs and respect up there at the top of the uh, Twitter trends in Ireland um, for today. Um, in terms of questions that have come in, predictably, <laughs> um, most of them are about an issue we're not going to put people on the spot on uh, during this seminar. It's about accreditation. And I think um, in fairness to the staff of UCD who've assisted us this morning, we, we have to appreciate that they're engaged in a dialogue themselves with other stakeholders about whether or not the programme would be accredited. But they were commissioned by the NCSE and the department on the basis that a programme had to be devised and delivered that could be accredited should a decision be taken by government and the NCSE to so do in the future. Now, what we know on the record is that the Minister for Special Education has indicated uh, that the department would be willing to consider accreditation once the, uh, the current cohort of students have finished the programme. So um, I'm not going to put Phyllis or Liam on the spot because it, it's, it's a delicate subject involving discussions at, at very high level, but I can go on record and tell you what Fawcett thinks, and we firmly think this programme must be accredited, and it's manifestly unfair to the students who are studying on this programme for them to complete it, um, but not to graduate with an accredited qualification. We, we, we think that the government, the department and the NCSE cannot stand over that. Um, that's manifestly un unfair and I'm not going to ask Phyllis or Liam if they agree with that or not because it would put you in a difficult position. Um, but I have a, a couple of other questions 
that have come in. Um, do you think that the current program, the UCD program, would be suitable for um, staff preparing to work as an SNA? E.g., if someone had made a career choice, yes, I think the role of the SNA is is for me. That's something I want to uh, to explore. Would the course be suitable for someone with no experience of working in schools? I'm muted. Thank you very much. Somebody has unmuted me there. Yes, Andy, indeed, and that's something that we are actively involved in. We are actually taking on um, some, you know, additional students uh, on the course in UCD. Uh, is we're opening our course to to funded applicants uh, in the event of not filling, we have we have permission to do this uh, in the event of not filling the the um, required number for each particular registration. So uh, th there there may have to be some slight modifications, but I don't think I think we I said earlier on we need to get the same message across to everybody working in a classroom. Everybody needs to be singing off the same hymn sheet. They need to, they need you know it, it's just important that we get this consistency and cohesiveness into to our training, um, both for teachers and for SNA, so that they're hearing the same. Now, obviously, teachers are at a slight, you know, higher level in terms of pedagogy. We will be adding on quite a lot in terms of the theoretical uh, background and embedding pedagogy into it. But uh, other than that, the facts and the information that we've put into this course uh, it cannot be changed. It, 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 you know, they are they are important. They are strategic, um, and they are very very closely aligned to to practice. So, and I think that's what people want. They want to know how to do the job well, and that's what we're about. So I hope that Thank you. Uh, question. you. You mentioned during your contribution that one thing that's key to success are, are good relationships, including good relationships in the classroom, mm -hmm. good relationships between SNAs and, and presumably teaching staff in the school, students and parents. One issue that's, that's cropped up is the, the, the title that we currently have for the role. Um, specifically the assistant element of it. Mm. Do you mm. think that helps the way that the, the role is currently uh, described? No, as, but uh, it doesn't sit comfortably, Andy. Do, do you think that helps form and cement those those essential good relationships in schools? Or, or no, well, I mean, you, you know, you know, think about a different uh, job yeah. title. Yeah, well, of course, you know, from the recommendation in the in the report, you know, the, the NCSE report was that we changed the title to inclusion support. Again, assistant was going to be in the title. But I think that, you know, it would have taken I think it would have taken the title to a higher level in terms of respect. Um, I don't think people have a problem with assistant uh, too much as they have with the fact that the role needs to be, um, you know, needs to, well, I think the circular is very vague. And I have brought this up with the NCSE that we need to revisit that official circular that describes the role. Um, and I think they've acknowledged this. I think the role, as you rightly said earlier, has evolved into a much broader um, domain of practice. And yes, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of, of, of the relationships that you alluded to just the start of your little question there, I think uh, that is coming from misunderstanding. It's coming from, a, there's an openness there to people interpreting the role as they want. And there is not, there, there is not consistency. Principles are not prepared. Um, in, in many cases, you know, they, it's on their own volition to prepare themselves for working with the troop of SNAs. And some are very good at this and some maybe not so good. And this is this is our difficulty that we have to address. We have addressed very extensively the area of communication, developing that, you know, that dynamic and the relationship that exists between the teacher and the SNA in the classroom. We've addressed that very, you know, quite considerably in the course. And also the, the other relationships that are happening with parents, with, with, uh, with the students as well. And, you know, there are restrictions and boundaries around those relationships. And we have, we have uh, you know, we have acknowledged these. And um, I think this is, you know, it's to get the clarity and to get the consistency and to make sure that everybody hears that same message, Andy. I think that's where it's really where, where that's coming from, you know. Thank you. Just one final question. And this isn't about accreditation for the UCD program, but it, it, hmm. it is about the minimum uh, essential qualification you need yeah. to, to work as an SNA, which is a slightly different topic. If, um, as an academic, you are, you are asked, looking at really any role, any job, what the minimum qualification would be, what factors would you look at before reaching a decision that it should be a QQI level six, seven, or, 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 or whatever uh, level you determine? What, what would you take into account in reaching that decision? 
Well, I would, I, if I were, if I were taking, uh, looking at it from our, our perspective at the academic level in, in an academic institution, I would be saying that we must provide um, the minimum amount of information that they need in order to do the practicalities of the role. But I think they are also, and we had a little argument about this at the start when we were doing the consultation process, I think they need to know the philosophy behind what they do. They need to understand, you know, the, the philosophy of inclusion and what it actually means to respect and to understand and to listen to children. And I think if we don't explore the finer details of, of the philosophy behind what they do, then I don't think they have an understanding of why they're doing it. So we can't just restrict our training to the how. We have to look at the why. And I think they deserve to get that theory I think you know so that's why we have pitched this course at a fairly high level but it's not but yet we're very you know very very you know conscious of the fact that it has to be within reach for the wide cohort of educational profiles and indeed that that is as you could see from my slide there earlier on that is narrowing I mean we have a very very we have two percent who meet the, the minimum requirement um, that is minuscule when you look at the, the population of SNAs. So I think, I think it speaks for itself in terms of, of what we're dealing with, a very, very skilled population of people coming from a very, you said this yourself, coming from backgrounds in finance and all kinds of backgrounds. So, um, yeah, I think we have to respect what we are working with. Our, all our students in UCD are, are seen as individuals. And, you know, we look at them as, as people before we look at them as students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. And thanks to you, Liam, for your contributions today. It's been very illuminating. And congratulations on designing and delivering an excellent programme through the UCD School of Thank Education. Thank you, Andy. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Over to you, Noreen. Thanks, Andy. I will, um, we will just go for a quick comfort break now. So if everyone wants to uh, grab a coffee, we will come back at half past 12 um, and we will be hearing from Shane Lambert, our AGS then. Thank you. Hi all, welcome back. We'll start back with um, Shane Lambert. I'm um, delighted to, um, introduce our Assistant General Secretary in Education. Over to you, Shane. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your time this morning. And in particular, thanks to the contributors uh, this morning. I hope everybody managed to get a warm cup of something on that break. It's still quite a chilly one out there. So look, we, we've heard fantastic contributions this morning. It was great to hear the views from SNAs themselves, uh, Pamela and Linda, in relation to their experiences and their views. I'm really heartening to hear Caroline's contribution from the IPPN and a clear understanding and recognition that both her and her colleagues in IPPN have for our SNA members and the role that they, they hold, the complexity of it, uh, and it's, it's advancements that have been made over the last number of years, in particular with regards kind of advancements uh, that we've made in terms of diagnosis and understanding additional needs and, and how we how we meet them. Um, it was great to hear from the contributors from UCD um, and, and their view of experience about the level of qualification uh, that they see from the participants on their courses and indeed the very comprehensive and detailed nature of the courses and what people expect uh, when they partake in those courses and I think it just really gives a flavor of the, the type of training that is required of an SNA to carry out the role in today's modern world. I thought the contribution in particular of Linda O'Sullivan was quite interesting because it spoke about the 1970s and a time before she was born. And actually, believe it or not, though you may not believe this on the basis of looks, it was actually a time before I was born as well, uh, as I was born on New Year's Day of 1980. And it just made me kind of ponder a little bit about what life was like back then, because I think it's important to think of that perspective when you think about when this qualification was set. Uh, for those of you from Dublin, you might remember the old orange CIE buses with the big black CIE mark on the side. Um, you might remember Sunday closing for shops. Um, you know, significant changes have happened since then. I mean, the 70s themselves seen significant reform in Ireland, uh, especially for women and women's rights. 
you think about the civil service or the bank ban, uh, the marriage ban that was in place where people couldn't work, a, a woman couldn't work if she was married. I think that was only lifted in the mid 70s or, or 1973, 75 and around that time. Women couldn't have a drink in a pub. Owning a house outright was prohibited. It's incredible when you look at the world in which it was then and you think about the perspective of how life was and what was seen as reasonable and rational and fair and, and right. Uh, and thankfully, we've come a long, long, long way uh, in many different ways of life. Obviously, we've seen huge progress in terms of civil society and how we look at things, but equally in terms of education. And it, it kind of staggers belief that we've come that way and we're now talking about really what is a practical reality on the ground, that we're recruiting SNAs at these levels pretty much every day in every school where recruitment happens is at this level. And yet the departments are refusing to recognize that and, and formalize it. It really doesn't make sense. SNAs have kept pace with all the change through their own efforts and their own volition and, and going and, and skilling themselves. They've done it all. And in actual fact, the service that's been provided today, which is an excellent service, is being provided on the back of SNAs and their dedication and commitment to the role in which they hold. And what we're looking to seek is just to formalize that reality. And I don't think that should be too much to ask to formalize the reality that happens today that SNAs are recruited at a level six or above. As we said, it's a fact that school employers are actively recruiting at that level. And the evidence was shown today. So, and it only stands to reason when you think about it that any employer would seek to recruit at a level. I mean, any employer that's out there, and obviously as a trade union official, we come across employers quite regularly. Any employer would want to recruit the highest caliber staff that they possibly can, but they certainly would want to recruit staff who are appropriately qualified to carry out the complexities of the role to the high standards that they expect. So it's proper and right that employers are seeking these qualifications as desirable. What's not proper or right or acceptable is that the department won't recognize and formalize that. It makes little or no sense. It also holds back the, the possibility and potential, both for SNAs, but also the role of the SNA itself. And it holds back students and parents from receiving improved services as we progress and move on. Because professionalizing the role of an SNA can only serve to benefit all in the education family. For employers, for school employers and the department, it solidifies the current standard set of recruitment for the future. And it ensures that there is a national standard that is set. So we don't have any one particular nook and cranny of the country that maybe isn't at that standard when the rest of the country has obviously moved on. For SNAs, it recognizes the hard work, the many skill sets, and both the physical and mental challenges of this role. And I think that's a really important aspect is you, you've got manual roles which generally have physical challenges. You will have other roles, maybe administrative or financial that have mental. The SNA has to deal with both sides of the house. They've got physical challenges in terms of the role they hold, but equally mental challenges that they face on a daily basis. It opens up the opportunity for further progress to recognize CPD, which can be structured and consistent. So we've heard about CPD happening at the moment, but CPD happens very ad hoc and by virtue of the good nature of some employers and the eagerness of SNAs. There should be a consistent and recognised level of CPD that takes place nationally, which every SNA can avail of. For students and parents, it ensures the incredible level of care that is provided today through the SNA's own efforts can continue, but also keep pace with modern changes. Um, and, and move at the pace in which the world moves at, which we all know now and accept. The world moves at an incredibly fast pace and it is incredibly difficult to keep pace with it, no matter what field you're in. This is not something that should happen in our view. This is something that must happen. It must be recognized by the Department of Education that the SNA role is a role that requires higher qualifications and three pass grades in a junior cert. It is a role that a 16 year old who has just finished that qualification could not walk into and embark on tomorrow. We need to face that fact. The department need to face that fact. So now we will hear from Frances Roberts, an SNA from Donegal. She's a member of our Connacht Ulster branch and Frances is gonna set out some of her experiences and views uh, in relation to her role of an SNA uh, and her experience that she's had throughout the years. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll hand over to Frances. 
The Special Needs Assistance Scheme was first introduced in 1979. Since this establishment, there have been so many changes and advancements in technology, medical diagnosis, and a better understanding of special education and SEM provision. Also, a much better understanding of how to provide education and to relate to individuals with conditions is prevalent today. SNAs have had to adapt through these developments by sourcing and undertaking their own CBT and investing our own time and money to stay professional in our role. Unfortunately, these changes have not been recognised by the Department of Education, as they still consider three Ds in the junior cert sufficient qualifications to become an SNA. Even though most employers of SNAs now look for a level six at a minimum, I work with SNA colleagues who have degrees. I have been an SNA for 18 years and I recall one of my lowest days when it was my first staff meeting. I was approached by the principal and was informed that the meeting was not relevant to me, but she would be grateful if I would cut the brown bread, butter it, jam it, and bring it into the staff room for teachers at tea break. Thank goodness, because of the union, SNAs now attend staff meetings in my school, but this is not the case in all schools. In my own experience, my previous career as a legal secretary, I achieved promotions quickly and became the senior partner secretary in the space of three years. 18 years as an SNA and no recognition for experience, dedication, innovative strategies for children with additional needs or continuous professional development. Why is there a glass ceiling for promotions on SNAs? Why is there no recognition of hard work and dedication that we show? No promotion path can leave us feeling lethargic and stale. There is nothing to aspire to. No promotion prospects deprives the opportunity to create leaders of SNAs who could potentially lead the team of SNAs within a school. Engage with colleagues on such matters as SEN curriculum, development, provide an SNA perspective to the management team and contribute in a strategic way to the overall provision within a school. Why is this not happening? Because there is no respect for SNAs. We need the department to take their head out of the sand and recognise that the role of the SNA needs to be professionalised and give SNAs the respect they deserve for putting up with the department's lack of respect and their own unprofessionalism since 1979. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, so next up, we have Madeline Hickey from the NCSE. Um, Madeline is a specialist lead in the area of policy and practice development within the National Council for Special Education, which is the NCSE. She's also a member of the NCSE Consultative Forum. Madeline has worked closely with UCD in the design and the development of the content of the SNA training course. Madeline is a former director of the Special Education Support Services, SESS, when she was on to comment from Holy Family School for the Deaf, Cabra Dublin 7. She worked for many years as a post-primary teacher of science and maths and as a teacher for the deaf. Unfortunately, Madeline couldn't join us in person today, so we have a recording of Madeline and um, myself, Andy and Noreen will take some questions after if there's questions on. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for your invitation to present to you today. My name is Madeline Hickey and I'm a specialist lead in the National Council for Special Education. I'm here to share with you some information on how the NCSE is supporting principals and schools on the deployment of special needs assistance in schools. The NCSE policy advice in 2018, uh, this review concluded that there was no doubt that the SNA scheme had been transformative and enabled many students to attend school. It is recognised that the SNA role is deeply valued by students, their parents and schools, and this has been an invaluable scheme. However, in the next slide, we will see that changes were required to the SNA allocation process, and these included difficulties 
with the annual and individual application process and how that worked for schools. A diagnosis led model, which was driven by labels of disability dominated. The variety of students without a diagnosis would also require intervention and the existing system posed bureaucratic load on principals and special education teams in schools. And in the next slide, we can see that the circular 3014 is still very relevant in the context of Department of Education policy. What has not changed is the role of the SNA. The role of the SNA is still very much in supporting the care needs of students and in helping students to work towards independence. There's a focus on primary care needs and secondary care associated tasks. But the flexibility of deployment is uh, certainly a clear change informed by the NCSE uh, comprehensive review of the SNA scheme. And in this context, the next slide we'll see, there are some clear changes informed by the NCSE policy advice. A diagnosis of disability is no longer required to access SNA support. The students with the greatest level of care need can achieve the greatest level of SNA support. Schools can make timely decisions on the allocation of the SNAs and schools are no longer required to submit individual applications for SNA support. Schools are enabled to include all students uh, and make the necessary adaptations and there's a continuity of allocation from year to year. So the schools and the principals now have the autonomy to deploy your valuable SNA support to the students who have the greatest level of need. The role of the NCSE in rolling out this new model include um, continual professional development, delivery, teacher professional development, um, in-school support, and the review and the allocation of resources. But it's important that the role uh, of the Department of Education is a governing role around the management of the SNA scheme generally. And in the next slide, we will see that there are many positive implications for the students. From the students' point of view, they will receive support according to their need. The schools will know what the child or the student can do for themselves. They, um, the student understands they won't have SNA support forever, only until they can support themselves. And their targets are designed so that they can become as independent as possible. They themselves have helped to set the targets, the student voice being very important in this space. And the school will match their students' needs to the right intervention. The school will seek very much to understand the needs of the student while always remembering that the, that the opinion of the student is very important. And in the next slide, we will see what the roles are for different individuals and in schools. But all of this planning has to be done with the, in consultation with par parents and guardians. There's a role for the principal, there's a whole school role, there's a role for the special education teachers and the class teachers, and most importantly, there's the role for the special needs assistant. The role for the special needs assistant is very much focused on a care role for primary care needs and those secondary care associated tasks that can be supported if capacity is available. The, the um, focus on the new model is the deployment of support to meet those students with the greatest level of need. And not all care needs require SNA support. That's an important uh, point to make. But the primary and the secondary care needs are uh, uh, identified in circular 3014. And in the next slide, we'll see in particular what the role of the SNA is in this new allocation model. The SNA is very much part of a team. Their role is to facilitate the inclusion of students who have care needs in schools. They're very much involved in the student support plan, in the care aspects of that plan, and they attend to primary care needs and secondary care associated tasks 
if the capacity is there to do so. In focusing in on what additional care needs, in the next slide we'll see that the care needs are needs that can be reasonably expected to be met with appropriate planning and preparation by the teaching staff. But the additional care needs where your role is important, really important, is it's to support those needs that can present a significant barrier to a pupil's ability to learn and participate in the school environment. More intensive support is required and those care needs are above that which would normally be provided by the students, teachers, by the teachers of the student. And some examples of care needs are in the next two slides. Uh, you'll be very familiar what these are, but just to outline them again as a reminder, assistance with feeding, assistance with toileting and general hygiene, administration of, med of medication, assistance with mobility and orientation, and assisting teachers to provide supervision in the class, the playground and the school grounds. And the last three are on the next slide, non-nursing care needs associated with specific medical conditions, and care needs that require frequent interventions, including withdrawal of a student from a classroom where essential, and assisting with moving and listing of, uh, lifting of students. Uh, an important aspect of this um, new model is that we, it aligns very much with the continuum of support model that has been in place for some time now in relation to teaching and learning. So the continuous support model is here on the left and on the right the diagram shows the alignment between the existing continuum of support model and the added dimension of the SNA continuum of support on the right. Uh, this is a really important aspect of this new model where they're both continuum of support both in terms of teaching and learning and in care needs are aligned. And in relation to um, supporting the principals in the schools, in the next slide we see that the, S the NCSE are supporting schools to uh, work through the deployment of the SNAs using a six-step decision-making process. Step one is there at the top of the diagram and that looks at who are the students we're talking about identifying the student's care needs. Step two is what are the goals for the students? You're setting goals and targets for individual students and what are these goals and targets? Step three looks at planning intervention approaches. How will we assist the student to meet the goals? Step four is, and step five are who is going to support the student to achieve this target, these targets? How will the organisation and the deployment of the support be uh, made available in the school? And step five then is, how will we know if the goals have been achieved? Monitoring and the recording and the reviewing of progress. Detailed um, training is available for principals and school personnel on the six-step six decision-making process. And this process aligns with other processes in the schools, including the school self-evaluation process. And in the next slide, we'll see that schools will be encouraged and to have a register of care needs for students. And here we have a sample register of three different pupils, X, Y, and Z. One pupil is in sixth class, one is in junior infants, and one is in senior infants. And schools will keep a register of these care needs. And again, this register will align with the continuum of support register, uh, which relates to the teaching and learning supports of schools. Um, you may ask in the, uh, around the SNA training. And in the next slide, I have um, uh, reference to the training that is currently available for SNAs, UCD and NCSE are collaborating on the um, training that is available. I've worked closely with Professor Kinsler and his team in developing the content of this course. And the link on the slide will provide you with the background information and more details about this training. There will be another thousand places being offered in spring 
2022. And I would encourage you to look at this closely and perhaps consider uh, availing of this training. And finally then, <clears throat> the learning really, that the key learning that we need to take away in relation to this new model of allocation in schools is on my last slide. Uh, importantly, no diagnosis is necessary for access to SNA support. Resources are deployed so that the students with the greatest level of need receive the greatest level of support. All students who have an identified need have a student support plan. The SNA role has not changed and plans are developed collaboratively between the teacher, the SNAs, the parent and the students themselves. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention today and for the great work that you do in schools. You and your schools are supporting students with special education and needs uh, to reach greater independence and ultimately improve the outcomes for these students. I'd also like to thank FORSA for giving me the opportunity to present to you today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was good to hear from Madeline there and the contribution from the NCSE. Um, Andy, you've heard Madeline's presentation there, Noreen. Um, we might just get some initial views from yourself on, on maybe some of the issues you see. Now, obviously, um, ourselves in the NCSE sometimes have very different perspectives in terms of various items, but we have seen the most recent NCSE report, and there's a lot of elements in that that we've looked at over the past couple of years and would welcome. Um, so maybe we just have a bit of a chat around that and get your views on that first. Yeah, thanks, Shane. I'll, I'll kick off and Noreen um, will have a contribution to make on this issue as well. I mean, it's very interesting to hear the perspectives of the NCSE, but the training that Madeline was describing is only now uh, being rolled out to school principals. And we would like to see at some stage um, similar training and briefing being provided to SNAs. Now, the school's inclusion model is being piloted in Community Health Area 7, 72 schools involved. The government's announced a plan to roll it out, but we met with them about 10 days ago, that's officials from the Department of Education, and they're not quite sure where the next rollout will be or when it will take place. Um, so it is something we need to engage with. The model itself presents some challenges for SNAs, specifically in terms of the student support needs. Um, and SNAs would need to be involved in drawing up student support plans. Um, there are some other changes to the role as well, which on the face of it seem fairly uh, minor in terms of fostering greater inclusion and independence. But um, those are new requirements and it's a repointing of the role that, that we see. Um, and it leads to the conclusion that there does need to be a review of the contract of employment, the national contract for SNAs, uh, which is due to take place under the building momentum agreement. And, and that will focus on things such as can we uh, review and abolish the requirement to work the additional 72 hours or uh, could those 72 hours be offset against educational or CPD requirements? Uh, the situation with those hours at the moment isn't um, sustainable. Um, but there are some benefits in what the government's proposing, especially in terms of allocations, because if they move to a front-loading model, uh, allocations are, are, are fixed, they can't go down, can't be reduced for a period of three years, which provides much needed job security um, for SNAs and the concept of permanent posts for the first time. There wouldn't be a risk of redundancy or loss of hours each time the NCSE announces its allocations. Um, but the risk is that SNAs might be seen as an all school resource. And what Madeline explained was the ability of a school principal under this proposed model uh, that they could deploy an SNA to support quite a wide range of students, quite a high number of students perhaps. And our worry on that is twofold. One, it dilutes the resource. Um, if you're expected to assist and support seven or eight students in a school, you can make only a minimal contribution for them uh, because you're spread too thinly. 
Uh, and the second worry is that at the moment, the SNA resource is quite tightly allocated and tied to a student with specific needs. Uh, if that tie is gone, that link is gone, you could find SNAs deployed in schools to do virtually anything at the discretion of the principal. So we need to find a way of ensuring that SNAs are not used as an all-school resource uh, before this uh, model comes in across the whole of the school sector. Uh, just to finish, Shane, by saying that we do plan to consult members directly by way of a consultative ballot to get your views once our discussions with the department have concluded. Thanks, Andy. I think that's the, the important bit is maybe to reassure because look, as sure as night follows day, there will always be proposals and changes on the horizon. And it's their job really to feed the concerns of our members into those engagements and make sure we we, we make sense of the proposals and, and you know deal with those concerns. Noreen, you were looking to come in there, Noreen, sorry. You're fine, uh, Shane, thanks. Um, yeah, I suppose one of the top questions coming in is, um, is this mod new model now agreed? I think you've answered that, Andy. And um, can you tell everyone what force of view on it is? I suppose um, SNAs, as you say, are afraid of the dilution of um, the role um, and that some children will be left behind um, if it's not done properly. Um, I, another question in was, will parents be able to see how much or how little SNA support their child will be getting um, if children who now have support are sharing the SNA support um, with others? Thanks, Nori. Andy, um, I just want to, on that, I mean, we, we've had some very slight, broad engagement on this over the last couple of months, but it, it's fair to say that there's significant lack of detail at the moment and it's maybe not as far advanced as what some of the commentary um, in political circles would indicate at the moment and um, so I mean I suppose our view is that when there, there's a pilot scheme and at the moment when that's being assessed and um, it's for us to then look and see where the opportunities lie within what's being proposed and where the dangers are on behalf of our members and, and as we said try to ensure that we we put the views across and soften any difficulties that we may have in the discussions that, that were to come. Yeah, Shane, I'll just make one final comment that um, prior to COVID, we were uh, having very regular meetings with the department about this. That all stopped once the pandemic hit, but where we got to was a guarantee that new posts that would be allocated to schools in mainstream schools uh, would be either full-time or part-time, e.g. 0.5, to do away with the fragmentation of SNA jobs and roles that we, we've, we've been worried about for uh, decades. Um, the dialogue's now picking up again, but they still haven't conducted the evaluation of the pilot in CHO Area 7. So things are not going to move particularly quickly. So we do have a period of time available to finish out the consultation and, and talk to members about the pros and cons of this. Uh, but clearly there's, there's going to be an issue for parents who heretofore may have had half an SNA's time or a whole, uh, the whole time of an SNA. And now the amount of support that um, children are given in schools will be determined locally according to how many students really have needs in the school rather than the, the allocation process as we've known it. So it would be a very different system. I think the important thing is that there's clarity for all stakeholders involved uh, as this progresses uh, and there will be blur with a lot of the IR issues that we deal with. And um, thanks Andy. Nori, over to you. Thanks Shane. Um, we will now uh, go on to our next video. So we have Katrina from the Munster SNA branch. Hi, my name is Katrina and I've been an SNA in a special school now for the last 28 years. My job has changed significantly and evolved to be nearly unrecognisable to the one I started all those many moons ago. What has changed, you might ask? Well, when I started in my role, the school I work in was classified as mild to moderate, with the majority of our pupils falling into the mild learning disability classification. Now, the school is classified as moderate to severe and profound, with the majority of our pupils falling into the latter classification. With these changes, we have seen the profile of the children that we work with change significantly, 
Our pupils now present with such dangerous and challenging behaviours that it usually results in a staff member being injured on a daily basis. We also have children with complex and multiple medical needs, some of which are receiving palliative care at the moment. However, while the skill, skills needed to deal with my work have changed and evolved, the qualifications needed to do the job have not. The minimum qualifications of three Ds in the junior cert, or as I did it, the inter cert, have been in place since 1979 and I feel have never been reflected of the skill set needed to perform the job of an SNA. I, like many other SNAs around the country, have upskilled myself to a level so far beyond these minimum qualifications that I feel to still have them in place as an insult to each and every one of us. Our role states that we are hired to tend to the care needs of the children, but just taking my school as an example, these care needs are so vast and so varied that we need to have knowledge in the fields of basic psychology, child development, sensory integration, complex and varied medical conditions and the emergency procedures needed to deal with each and every one of them. And also staying generally tech savvy while completing training in various forms of augmented communication, none of which was catered for during my intercert. The education system as a whole, I feel, is quite hierarchical. And I feel the department are loath to change the minimum qualifications as to do so would mean that for the first time, and rightly so, SNAs would need to be seen as the professionals that they are, rather than the non-teaching staff or lesser beings that they view us to be. Only last week it was brought to my attention that my local education centre were holding training entitled Assisting Teachers to Maximise the Role of the SNA in the Mainstream Primary Setting. To say this incensed me is an understatement. This portrays our profession as nothing more than a commodity that needs to be reined in in order to maximise our usage. There has never been an acknowledgement that each and every SNA goes above and beyond their remit on a daily basis for the children and young people in our care, while doing so with a professionalism and a commitment that goes far beyond our pay grade. I do honestly believe that until our role is professionalised, such an acknowledgement will never be forthcoming. I have been a member of the Forza Union for a very long time, and I am a firm believer in solidarity and collegiality. And to that end, I am so thankful that after working on the minimum qualifications in the background for many years, Forza have now launched a national campaign. And I will give this campaign my full commitment. I truly believe that each and every SNA needs to get behind this campaign and should be lobbying for the department to make us officially endorsed qualified practitioners based on our sophisticated skill set developed in response to the complexity of the needs presenting in our work, which has resulted in an expertise that is far beyond that of a student leaving college with the degree level at the moment, I believe. This skill set has been developed over many years and in some cases decades. And it has been consolidated by further study and continuing CPD. So it is to this end that I look forward to a future where we will be placed formally on a professional footing and given the acknowledgement that while our roles are different to those of our teaching colleagues, they are by no means less than, nor have they ever been. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina. We will now hear from Dr. Jean Hennifer. Jean's professional experiences in education began in her role as a history teacher in England. Subsequently, she attended University College Dublin, completing her Master's in Library and Information Studies and PhD. For the latter, Jean was awarded the National Children's Strategy Research Scholarship, as well as the Government of Ireland Postgraduate Scholarship. During her studies at UCD, Jean served as an undergraduate tutor in the School of Information and Communication Studies and has since, for more than a decade, lectured in the MLIS programme. Her principal experience of post-primary education in Ireland has been as a research development officer for educational support services. This role began with the Junior Certificate School Programme, continued with the National Behaviour Support Service and 
Consequently, as a member of the National Council for Special Education Support Service. During this period, she worked with the school communities to promote evidence informed practice and facilitated teacher as well as student action research projects throughout the country. Okay, can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Thank you. Thanks very much. My goodness, it's it's wonderful being here today. Um, I want to thank Andy, Noreen, Shane, and all your colleagues at Forza for inviting me um, to attend, but also to present. Um, this is another step in my learning journey about the work um, and the contribution that special needs assistants make to inclusive education in Ireland. And I would be, you know, I, I started out as, as Noreen was saying to you all, um, you know, I, I worked um, for the NBSS, the JCSP, the NCSE as a researcher. And, and so that was my first, and, and as you can tell from the accent, okay, um, I'm not from these woods, all right? I came over, in the early 80s from Philadelphia and have been here ever since. And so when Linda was talking in her video and Shane was talking in his presentation there about the changes that have taken place in Ireland, I certainly would have been witnessing those um, from my little position as being an American abroad. Um, but anyway, getting back to the point I was going to make is that when I was working um, as a research development officer for the support services, I first encountered this, this whole role, this, this profession of special needs assistance. It was new to me. And I did a lot of reading around it. I read policy documents, I read research reports. So I thought, okay, I kind of have a sense of what it is these good folks do. But it was only when I had a career change about three years ago and I left the support services and I took up a job as a school librarian at a post-primary school in Dublin. And I had the very good fortune to work with an amazing special needs assistant. She was absolutely brilliant. And while I've left the school now, I'm still in touch with her because she is such an important person and the role she played in the school supporting one child officially, but also the fact that she reached out and was supportive to so many kids and everybody adored her. And, and still do. And the work she did was magnificent. And Carolyn mentioned earlier about that quality of innate kindness for SNAs. And my colleague in that school, she emanated kindness for all staff and students. And so that gave me further insight into really what, what it's all about. And Shane, you mentioned there about you know, the physical demands. Well, my friend, my colleague, she had great physical demands because her student that she was, in, you know, working with was in a wheelchair and the school was not designed to accommodate that, okay? And so she went in there from the very beginning with this first year student and she was an advocate for that student. And she worked so hard to get the school to put in proper lift and proper ramps for the one student. She was an absolute star, this SNA. And I know actually from the research I'm gonna to talk to you about that we did at Hibernia, that she's not alone in this, that this is a group of people out there in our schools who are doing wonderful, wonderful work and they're brave and they're mighty and they need to be respected and they need to be recognized for the work that they do. So I'm very much learning, I felt Oh, I benefited so much today listening to the guest speakers and to the, the video presentations. It's again, opening my eyes to um, what's involved in all this and the complexity of the work that's being done. Um, so just to keep going here. So when I went over to Hibernia full-time as a lecturer, um, I was delighted, you know, because Mary Kelly, head of our school, asked myself and the research team comprised of Aoife Lynham, Kevin Myers and Keith Young, if we would do an exploratory study for FORSA with their membership, SNA membership about just ideas and experiences that SNAs were having and their 
thoughts about training and, and what qualifications they might like to have. And that was brilliant. And so we, we put together a survey and we disseminated it. So I'm gonna share with you today, just some of the findings, some of them, not all of them, findings of that, that questionnaire that we, we distributed to force members. But what I really want to say before I get into the, the nitty gritty of the data and, and, and all of that, is that I was overwhelmed professionally and also personally as a researcher who's been doing research for over 20 years now. I have never received such an outpouring of generous, honest comments, you know, to questions. People spent so much time, it was obvious they spent so much time completing that questionnaire and they gave it themselves and they told their stories. And that, you don't always get that when you're doing research, you know? So it just attested to the fact and, and revealed, the data revealed how genuinely devoted the individuals who completed this questionnaire are to their work, the affirmation they get from it and their sense of advocacy, okay? But also critically, what their generous offerings in the survey revealed to us as a research team was what also is missing for them at the moment. And I was particularly struck then by Francis, all of the, the SNAs who spoke today, I was struck by all of them. But one point that Francis so eloquently made was about the idea that, you know, SNAs, you're professionals. You need to, re you recognize as professionals and respect as professionals. And that is sorely missing, you know, at the moment. I know it, it varies from school to school, but you do need to be recognized from the top all the way down on an individual school basis and teachers levels as well. Okay, so without further ado of me going on and on, I'm just gonna share with you, um, hopefully this clicker is gonna work for me. Yes, okay, great. So, so basically we were asked at Hibernia to develop a little exploratory study to get a comprehensive understanding of the different areas that currently practicing special needs assistance thought would be useful in a level six program. So at the time, um, there was 10,000 special needs assistants um, in the trade group FORSA, and they were invited to participate in the survey. So by January, 2021, we, I think we, we sort of disseminated the original survey in late October, early November, and by January, we had received almost 1,500 responses. I was blown away. I thought that was amazing. And, and really, we were all very, very delighted with that. Um, just to give a bit of uh, demographics here, the majority of respondents were female, um, but we did have some male respondents as well, which was lovely. Sorry, I'm just trying to change slides. Sorry, Alan, would you maybe, oh, no, I got it, thanks. Okay, so interesting. Yeah, this was interesting because um, particularly just, just listen to, um, to people talking, especially Phyllis um, in her presentation about the level of educational qualifications. So in our, sample our population we had 52.4 percent of those responding who had level six or above in terms of their educational qualifications okay and then also it was mentioned before in some of the other presentations about the nature of some of those um, educational backgrounds so things such as montessori teaching practical childcare, nursing degrees, business. So there's, it was really rich um, and interesting to see, you know, how qualified these professionals are, you know, and that, that these skills, this, this talent set should be recognized as well in the work that they're doing. Oh, 
Okay, so we asked um, we asked them to identify where they were currently working in the educational system. So the vast majority of our respondents were working in the primary school sector. We also had some in post-primary, just over a quarter, and then a small section were working in special schools. So one of the questions that we set up was we asked them to identify, we, we gave them a list of various different special educational needs. And we asked them then if they would identify which ones were, they were supporting students who had these needs at the moment, but also in the past. So basically, you know, what their experience was of doing this, okay? Um, so as you can see, the, the ASD is quite high, behavior, emotional support is high, GLD is high, but it gives you a flavor and, and it's been spoken to already today about the diversity of needs. And certainly one would have seen, um, having lived here from the 1980s, that the identification of different needs has really developed so much, so greatly over time. Um, many of these um, special needs would not have been recognized. They would not have been catered for. And therefore this evolution is huge. And that actually means as well that the pressure on special needs assistance is greater as well because they're trying to cope with supporting these needs and having the proper training to do so. Okay, so we asked the question about what sort of training they had had or had received. And this kind of flags as well, comments that were made before. I think our first uh, video, Pamela was talking about this and Francis did as well, about you know the fact that special needs assistants really take on board. They, they go out and they try to get training themselves and it's not recognized, it's not documented. Shane spoke to that as well about CPD and it being recognized. So here's an array, okay, of, this was an open-ended question. So the participants just listed what special educational needs training they had undertaken. So as you can see, it's, it's widespread, it's vast, okay? And it also reflects, again, going back to that idea, the diversity of needs of the students that they're working with. So anyway, also, as Andy mentioned at the beginning, you know, the idea that there should be some sort of recognition of this training that SNAs undertake on their own time on a Saturday, you know, or at night somewhere, and sometimes at their own expense. So that this is an important point, I think. So we didn't actually ask them specifically about the nature or the extent of the support they were giving to students at the moment, but we did have something, uh, a question about what training they thought would be useful, okay? And that, I've just included a couple quotes from this, gives an indication of the extent, the diversity, the range and the depth of the support and the needs that they are working with children with. So one participant wrote, working with a child with behavioral difficulties in both junior and primary school and also older children. I feel it is one of the most challenging roles that an SA, SNA may face. Another wrote, I would like training in diabetes and cerebral palsy as I work with a couple of students with these challenges and I would like to know more. The student I work with has two hearing aids without which he cannot hear. Sometimes he misses out on what teacher has said as he also has ASD. And another quote that I haven't been able to include on the slide, uh, the, the SNA wrote, I think there should be more basic medical training as we deal with medical issues on a daily basis. So the scope of the work that is expected from SNAs is so vast in many cases. And yet they, they require training, they want the training and it's not accessible to them. And they're calling for it, they're pinpointing it and saying, I need to know more. And that attests to the professionalism 
of this group of individuals because they are saying, I want to upskill myself. I want to train myself. I want to keep up to date with what's going on. Sorry, I just go back there. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, we're back in action here now. So one of the questions we also asked them, we gave them a list of four different areas of you know, support for special, different types of special educational needs. And we asked them to identify those areas that they felt at the moment they were best equipped to support students in these areas. So as you can see from this, um, very high rankings in all of the, the different areas, okay? Um, sensory impairment that would have been related to, it was identified in the survey as visual or hearing impairments. And so that was less, less so. Um, the ASD, neurodevelopmental disability, um, that seemed on the high end as well. And then the GLD category with cognitive development disability was high as well. Um, physical motor skills disability, mm, about 50%. So just to give a flavor of the sorts of, I suppose, confidence and skill set that people feel that they, they have at the moment, and maybe as a way of planning for the future in terms of training in CPD. So one of the things that we wanted to find out in sort of, if you're, if you're gonna be putting together um, CPD or higher level courses for special needs assistance, we wanted to find out, you know, would they be interested in considering further study in their careers? And so it, basically only about 10% said no, they weren't going to consider it. So I think that's a really encouraging sign. And it doesn't surprise me because of the nature of the data that came before this question, because it was quite obvious that this is a group of people who really want to keep on the ball and up to date with everything that's going on and to upskill themselves. So that was very, very encouraging. So some of the things that we asked them about, we said, could you identify in an open-ended question, you know, what sort of areas you would like to do further study in? And so autism, behavior support, the medical, physical care needs of students, and also communication was a, a, an element there as well that they would like to develop further. That was in terms of both communication, helping their students develop communication skills, speech and language, all of that was, they were great interest in that and also OT, um, but also communication with staff and that whole relationship thing in the staff room that was alluded to earlier. So some of the comments I thought were lovely was how to deal with challenging, disruptive, aggressive behavior as this is a daily event and it's a health and safety issue. So that came out, that was kind of, I'm, I'm including that quote here because that did come out quite a a number of times, it was a theme that emerged from the data that SNAs do worry sometimes about the behavior um, and their own safety and how to deal with it. Um, so that's why that's been presented here in this slide because it, it, it was a major theme. Another road to training with regard to various disabilities as there is more up-to-date research which should be shared with us to enable us to perform to the very best of our abilities. This is an important one. Katrina mentioned that you know, she's been doing this job for 28 years. And what we found in our survey was that almost 60% of our respondents had been working as an SNA, were working as an SNA for upwards of 20 years or more. So this is the point. And what they were saying, some of these participants were saying was that, you know, when I started, we didn't know as much about ASD, for, for an example. So I want to know now what's happening. I want to find out what the literature says. I want to find out what the research says about it. What are the best interventions and strategies? I want to upskill myself. And then finally, this one, catheterization training, doing it at the moment with no medical training and insurance doubts. So I was very determined that I would make sure in the, the report that we provided to FORSA that this quote would be included because I think that that's, that's critical, okay? 
So we also asked them if they were considering further studies, what would be their preference for the way that they would be taught? And so it was kind of evenly divided, you know, uh, remote virtual program, blended program, um, you know, who knows what the future holds. So, but it's an interesting one. I think that kind of balance um, because SNAs work really hard during the day, you know, they're, they're in those schools, they're supporting their students and they're dealing with the day-to-day -day in a school. And so what kind of course, what kind of program, if you if it's something part-time or how's it gonna work? How are you, you going to support SNAs to further their education? And we also asked them if they thought that there was barriers to maybe pursuing further education in their, in their own lives. And we did about just over half actually said that, yep, there are barriers that would prevent me from pursuing further education. So these included the, the most common, commonly listed reasons were the time constraints. And that goes again to what I was just saying a minute ago. They're busy people in their schools. Commitments to family life and also their own children at home. The financial aspect of it, because again, yes, who's paying for their study? Who's gonna support their CPD? Is there a program? Is it accessible? the cost, you know, because many of these uh, respondents wrote in their comments in the survey about taking on extra courses themselves in their own time and paying for it with their own money, okay? And it's not getting recognized. So one of the questions then we asked them was if they were to identify what would be the five most important elements to include in, of course, a level six course for SNAs. And it's interesting now um, because Phyllis and Liam talking about the UCT course and some of these, some of these five top elements where they spoke about in their program, which is lovely. It's absolutely great. So the highest percentage was actually SEN in terms of upskilling yourself, learning about all the different varieties of additional needs that children have that you might need to be working with once you enter the profession. So that was the top. The second was the strategies. What strategies or, in, or interventions are out there and available? Evidence-informed practices and programs. Tell us about those. We want to know about those. Behavior, huge. So that could be anything related to positive behavior management, disruptive behavior, and also pulling into the behavioral theme, the, the whole idea that was mentioned earlier about well-being and mental health, that comes into that too. Communication was the next point with this, um, and that encompasses many things. As I said before, previously in another slide, that you know, you're talking about working with nonverbal children and how you support their communication needs and their communication development speech and language therapy, but also communication with students um, and also communication with colleagues in the school. And I say use that word colleagues deliberately because I'm not just talking about other special needs assistants, I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about management because you're all colleagues. So that sort of bit would be our participants thought was important in a, a qualification course. And then I have here as well, inclusion, inclusive education. And this, this is, as you all know, this is something that we're all working on. We're trying to make our educational system inclusive. And what does that actually mean? How you define inclusion might be different how I define inclusion, but that's not the point really. What they're saying here, the comments that they made anyway with the survey was that a program of instruction, a program of qualification, accreditation for special needs assistance at level six minimum, okay? Needs to really deal with all of the varieties, all the variables involved in inclusive education. That includes the theoretical premise of it, the legislative premise of it, as well as the practicalities of it, and all the different categories of students that we consider when we're talking about inclusive education. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap up there now, um, just to say that 
it was, as I said at the beginning, this is a learning journey for me. And I, I, I feel privileged to be here for today because I have learned more listening to everyone. Um, but I think, you, you know, in, in terms of concluding this and, and the survey itself and the findings, um, that we know it is quite obvious that the role responsibilities and expectations that we have of SNAs are growing. They continue to grow day by day by day by day, okay? And so what was expected perhaps in the past, now the expectation is mighty because we're more aware of what children's needs are, okay? So this, this is a reason in itself why SNAs should be provided with adequate training professionally throughout their career. Okay. And the other thing, just to say that I was so impressed with the range that, that came through the data, the skills that the participants have, their knowledge and their training that they have. And, and that's what's important in terms of a professional practice, because this is going to be something, as I said, that needs constant review and development. So I want to thank you all for listening to me and just if there's any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Jean. Very interesting presentation. We're well over time at this stage, so we've really only got time for, I think, one question. Um, when we asked Hibernia College to conduct the survey and we were, we were discussing um, what it might show. What we were interested in was the, the view of the college as to would a level six program be appropriate to meet the educational needs of SNAs, both in terms of starting out on your career, but also if you were in service and you wanted to do a qualification, um, would the level six, uh, would a level six course be, be appropriate? But what's your view on what the data is showing you um, about the appropriateness of, of level six as opposed to um, uh, a course at level five or, or, or below? Well, I think definitely level six is appropriate, you know, because you're talking about, it's, it's not just the, the practical skills, but it's also providing, you know, the theory behind and, and also the literature around all the various different conditions that that these individuals will be, you know, supporting once they get out into a school. So I think, and, and as well, um, just even from listening to people today talking, but also from the data that we received from your members, um, these are individuals who are very well qualified. You know, the, the, by far, they're not 16 year olds who have a junior cert, you know? They are qualified individuals. and. One, one respondent actually has a PhD. Do you know, so I think, I think we don't, we shouldn't be underselling ourselves here with this. I think we need to aim as high as we can go to provide education and training um, for special people who want to be special needs assistants and also those who are presently SNAs. Thank you, Jean. Well, uh, time is against us, um, so, I'm just going to make a couple of observations before handing back to Noreen to close the seminar. Thank you again to all the contributors, those who've contributed live and those who very helpfully assisted by recording their contributions. And thanks for all of you who sent in uh, questions. We, we simply couldn't get to all of the questions in the time available. The next stage of the campaign moves to the Oroctus on the 8th of December, we'll be holding uh, an online briefing for elected members of the Oireachtas on this issue about reviewing the minimum essential qualification uh, for SNAs. And we will continue to ask you as members to contact your, uh, your local TDs and senators who you may know to ask them if they would support the call for a review and a change to the minimum essential uh, qualification. And as I mentioned at the outset, this sits within a wider campaign to highlight uh, the role of SNAs and ensure that the job is recognised and respected. We're uh, shortly about to start 
negotiations on a review of the national SNA contract um, and the use of the 72 hours and the requirement in, in post-primary to be available to work in the months of June. We know that the 2014 circular needs review, um, especially in the context of the school's inclusion model. Uh, and we also know that we have a, a job of work to do to really start to rattle a cage a bit on valuing our SNAs and, and giving them some career development and pay progression options because it's a single grade. And when you look across the public service, um, it's very rare to find a grade with no promotional outlets whatsoever. If an SNA gets to the top of the scale, no matter how good they are, how, how many qualifications they might hold, they sit at the top of the scale unless they choose to go and retrain and do a different job, often in, in teaching. So that option as well is, is something we'll be discussing with uh, the Department of Education over the coming weeks and months. But at the heart of a lot of the problems our members experience, it's this, this issue of, about respect that the job is seen as being unskilled and unqualified. And as well as resolving the other important industrial relations issues, if we can make progress in putting in place an acceptable qualification, we'll have taken several significant steps to ensure that the role of the SNA um, is properly valued um, and is recognised. Um, we've got now, uh, I think, to number two in the list of Twitter trends for today. We're still behind NEFET, and NEFET are probably one of the most important uh, bodies in the country at the moment. So thank you for your um, your retweets, and keep, keep tweeting. It's hashtag respect for SNAs, and you'll be hearing more from us as this campaign uh, rolls out over the following months. So thank you very much for your attendance. I'll hand you back to Noreen as chair. Thanks, Andy. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here today and for giving up your time on a Saturday in December. I want to thank most sincerely all the speakers um, and contributors to our seminar, to Andy Shane and all the education team, and to the branch activists who work tirelessly on behalf of our members every day. A special mention to uh, our lead organiser and acting director of the campaigning, Kevin Dunu. Thank you for all your help in organising today's event. We hope to see you all again soon as we continue our campaign. Thank you.